to come from our future, a, our optimal temporal reality timeline. They noticed with you know, their, their fourth density, a very um, high consciousness being, uh, high consciousness beings, and their technology is amazing. At some point in their future, and hopefully our future, they noticed something similar to the Mandela effect. And they used their technology to track it back. And they realized that their timeline was disappearing on them, that uh, things were starting to change at a drastic rate. So what they did is they sent a very small group back in time, about 17 million years. And their job was to steward or maintain their timeline to make sure that that timeline was not interrupted or changed in any way. So that small handful of Anshar that were sent back 17 million years, over that 17 million years, they became a huge, thriving civilization of their own. Multiple cities underground, and uh, they stayed quietly influencing us as they could, um, both mentally and appearing to us at different points in time um, to, to give us information that would help us grow in consciousness and steward that timeline. So where do the Anshar live? How, how many people here watch Cosmic Disclosure? So pretty <laughs> close to everybody. Okay. Well, I was brought down to their, I guess, it was more of a holy type of, uh, um, I don't know, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of like a, um, a place where the holy people go to be set aside. So it's kind of like a sanctified area. And when they walked me out into their city area, I saw huge domed buildings, I saw up in, in the pillars of the rock, there were um, lights and balconies built in. They had built buildings into the actual pillars. How do they live differently than us? The Anshar are, of course, a fourth density group. They think completely differently than us. Um, a lot of times people ask, how come the Anshar do this? How come they do that? And it's, it's because they have a completely different level of consciousness. They do not view anything the same way that we do. And of course, they're fourth density, and we're considered third, fourth transitional. We're in the process, as is our planet, of transitioning fully into fourth density. Now, there's, all of us have our own you know, belief systems, ideas that we've put together over years about what are the, the different densities. And what, it has been ex what has been explained to me is that a change in density begins with an expansion in consciousness. That these density or these vibrations are a vibration of consciousness. So as our consciousness expands and we have more um, power or more uh, understanding of how to use our co-creative consciousness, then um, physically, the physical part starts to catch up with the consciousness. You know, David and I have had many conversations, um, you know, f for a while he expected there to be some sort of a solar flash, and then we, we start floating around and, you know, using telekinesis, and how it was explained to me is that is not how it happens, that we get an... Um, an expansion of our consciousness, and then we begin to look around and say, you know, are things different or am I different? What, what occurs is our consciousness expands and we, we view everything in a completely different way. And we approach things in, in, in that manner. And as we begin to learn how to manipulate and control that consciousness, uh, that co-creative consciousness, then we begin to um, figure out, you know, everything is vibration, this chair, the wall behind me. And once we learn to manipulate that vibration with consciousness, we begin to have um, abilities to affect the physical world.
you know, things like telekinesis and all of those things begin to build. It's just not going to be a, uh, a sudden change. We're not going to go from, um, you know, arguing with each other to all of a sudden, you know, like I said before, floating around and, and using telekinesis. So Kari, or Ari, for quite a while I was just calling her Ka-Ari. She explained to me that her and her family and her sister was there with her when I first met them. And they come from the house of Ka, and her name is Ari. So when I, when I speak to her, it's Ari. It's not Kari. And I did that because a lot of people were um, feeling like they were getting communication from Kari because everyone focused on her. And uh, we needed to know, you know, who was fantasizing and who was really having communication. And people are receiving communications from the Anshar, but it's not all Kari, Ari. There are many hundreds of them that um, reach out to us and our higher selves on a continuous basis. When I interfaced with Kari, the information that was shared between us I learned that she was over 130 years old, which is very young for her people. They live to be you know, 800, 900 years old, and they have ways to, um, if, if they don't want to transition, they can preserve in, in that, that life and, and stay alive in this density even longer. And I think it's been about a year ago when I first had that meeting. And what occurred is, I really didn't have a whole lot of warning. There was a bright flash, and I'm in a, a cavern area. And it was a temple area, a domed room, and I was in the middle of it. And her, her sister, and a, a couple other, the Anshar, walked up and introduced themselves to me. And they, they wanted me to observe a meeting between the, uh, with the Inner Earth Council, and they uh, and I guess many of you remember the very embarrassing cleansing process they made me go through um, beforehand. Um, I was, that was back when I was uh, about 65 pounds heavier and uh, was uh, very self-conscious about it. And uh, I was instructed to remove all of my clothing in front of all of these people and, and get into a fountain and go through this cleansing ceremony where you washed different parts of your body in order and uh, it was a very uncomfortable uh, experience for me. I was, I was very uncomfortable. The, the mind meld, it was not just a simple interface like I've had with many different beings. I was, usually when there's an interface, there, it's a, uh, just a bi-directional kind of uh, communication. With this uh, mind meld, we were both pulled out of our bodies to in, in, in between where we were sitting, my consciousness, my awareness was pulled out and it blended with hers. And after that moment, I was never the same. It changed me on, on a, on a, in, in a major way. I went from, you know, I, she talked to me about the diet and uh, very soon after that, I, I was refusing to switch over to a high vibratory diet and uh, so apparently they arranged for me to get food poisoning and from eating meat. And uh, I got deathly ill. I got very ill and immediately switched over to being vegan for um, just, you know, cold turkey switched over. And, uh, and that was a rough transition for me as well because I was not being a proper vegan. And I ended up getting malnutrition. It was, it was very rough, but it was a process that uh, was pretty much instigated by the Anshar. The experience also forced me to look at different issues I had from a whole new perspective. I was seeing it from her perspective. And she counseled me on all the things that she saw that, needed, that I needed to work on to be able to continue this mission or to be successful. And she has continued doing that to this day. So what role does Kari play as a priestess in the Anshar society? The, um, the priest caste, they pretty much are the ones who interact with us on the surface. 
the rest of their population has, um, they, they were beginning, in the beginning, the whole population was focused on maintaining that timeline. But the masses of their um, people who were not uh, designated to work on that, like the, the, the priestess and priest caste, they were just working on their own growth and spiritual uh, vibration. The people I saw in the city were, had a completely different, uh, I would say energy, but attitude. They, they were not, they were focused on, on uh, raising their vibration and not so much focusing on the surface like, like the priest caste was. One of the main things that Ari communicated to me in the beginning that I reported was the imbalance of the masculine and feminine in our society. She stated that before the, um, uh, we've had two catastrophes that, that um, are in our recent history over the last 50,000 years. And after the second cataclysm, the um, masculine and feminine, uh, they found a way to come back into balance. The reptilian groups, the Orion groups, did not want that balance. So they began to create um, different types of religions, different types of um, social uh, norms that would disrupt that. So that, in turn, threw the planet out of balance. In order for us to attain that um, optimal temporal reality, not only do we have to find that balance, but we need to find the spiritual balance as well. And that all goes back to the Blue Avian message. They're trying to communicate the same thing to us, the Anshar are, and it all has to go back to karma and forgiving ourselves. As I've stated before, all of the traumas that you've had, they have mass and they become anchors for you that uh, cause resistance for these energies that are coming in, these cosmic energies. So the more that we focus inwardly on forgiving ourselves, forgiving others, and um, balancing our karma, the, um, the fewer side effects we have from these energies coming in. You know, uh, I've mentioned that you know, the good are getting better, the bad are getting worse, and the crazy are getting crazier. And it's all because of these energies and, and their side effects. So I kind of talked about this. Balancing the, the masculine and the feminine, I guess we have a lot of preconceived ideas of what masculine is and feminine is. That's, I mean, you watch TV, you see uh, the commercials that come on, you know, the sports, and there's such a, um, a, a broad difference between the uh, feminine and masculine energies. And that's why we have the, the, the problems of war when, before the last cataclysm, when they had uh, balance, before the reptilians and the Orions stepped in, they were a matriarchal society. They, the elders were almost all women. The leaders were almost all women. There was a lot of peace, as you can imagine, during that time. Well, the Orion group did not want that balance or peace here, so they had to disrupt it. And some of these genetic farmer groups were, were not pleased because this, the, these 22 different genetic programs are also spiritual programs. And as we raise consciousness and become more spiritual, it has a direct effect on our DNA. And that balance needs to be maintained, that masculine and feminine, for the DNA to keep progressing to a point to be a good antenna for us to pull in these energies and transform with them. If we are not able to readjust or get the masculine feminine back in balance, we will not, or at least a, a good portion of us are able to do that, then we're not gonna reach that optimal temporal reality. So how do I meet with Kari now? Typically, now, mainly, she contacts me through what David called the construct. And I think he stole that from the Matrix. <laughs> but it's, it's very similar. It is a zone that 
we co-create together. They create a, um, a space for us to meet in, a, a, a different uh, vibratory uh, place that we meet mentally, and it's not a physical meeting. When you first arrive, it's all white. It's just, just like uh, on the matrix. And then um, as we begin to interface with each other, then what we think about be begins to manifest within that environment. So we kind of co-create. Uh, we'll have a conversation, and kind of like a presentation right here, we will have um, holographic or 3D objects or concepts appearing. So it is not just a verbal or mental communication. Um, there's also um, different colors that will fly, like that uh, relate to emotions. Um, she'll be, uh, she'll show me something in the construct in a three-dimensional sort of holographic way. But at the same time, there'll be colors flashing behind her, and they uh, coincide with different emotions and thoughts that she's having. So telepathic, you can, you can send a lot of information back and forth telepathically. But when they use these other, I guess, symbols in that state, the amount of information that is sent back and forth increases exponentially. And it, at times, she still does pull me down in the physical. But that has become more and more um, rare. I reported recently on Cosmic Disclosure that they pulled me down, and um, they were in the middle of pretty much an evacuation. They were preparing for um, these energies to come in. And the reason that they were evacuating is that their vibratory level of consciousness has developed past fourth density. They're a transitional species herself. And each time one of these cycles occurs, their entire population will evacuate to a basically a temporal bubble. And it's very similar to the temporal bubble that I've explained outside of Jupiter and uh, Saturn. If you're, if you, those of you who remember, the uh, Super Federation Council would meet inside this spatial anomaly, temporal anomaly, and we would fly into it, and we'd have to punch in and punch out in, in the exact same trajectory. When, you, when we would go in, there would be no stars. And no matter where you were, what galaxy you were in, you could enter that temporal reality from your galaxy or your star system. If they, when you punch in, you're, you're leaving, like, uh, let's say you're in the Andromeda galaxy, you enter the temporal reality, and then you're in this null zone. It's, it's, not, it's really nowhere. And you have to leave by punching out in the same way, and you end up back in your galaxy, or the, where you entered from. So people from multiple galaxies can meet very easily. So how does Kari assist me in my life? She gives me a lot of counseling. But basically what she does is guide me through figuring out my own uh, problems and my own solutions. Like when I had, I had some significant issues with my marriage and my relationship with my father, and she was trying to encourage me to clear that karma. And when I would come to her and ask her about marital things, well, they're fourth density. Marriage is a third density concept. And she shared with me quite a bit about how they live. Because of the way we perceive things, I, there's a lot I haven't shared because we would perceive it wrong. Or we would, try to, we would try to emulate them before we're ready. They do not have marriage. They have family groups. And these family groups, they help raise each other's children. They are... Uh, intimacy is seen as an energetic exchange. It's not seen the way we see it with morality and all these different ways. So we... Most likely, if I shared everything, we would mirror our society and way of thinking on top of them, and we would, uh, you know, label them as being uh, immoral or um, just someone that we shouldn't listen to because their beliefs are, and, and way of living is so much different than ours. Now, the Anshar are assisting people on the surface more than they ever have in the past. One of the things that's made a lot of people very uncomfortable is there was deception involved. They would meet with people 
and tell them I'm from the Pleiades or from this place or this place when they were actually from a different timeline and were living below our feet. They did this not to just not to deceive us, not not just to be uh, to be deceitful, but they did it for operational security. We had at that point we had developed technologies that were becoming a danger to them and their society. We were developing deep earth penetrating um, weaponry for that we were using to fight against uh, the Orion group. Well, for, after a while, we stopped differentiating and started started uh, attacking all the different bases. And but they uh, we referred to them as embassies. What the Anshar have been doing, they sit in these chairs that float off the ground that look like an egg split. The technology they have down there is it's all consciousness based. Every piece of technology is powered by the collective consciousness of the Anshar. They're pulling um, energy from the collective consciousness to power all of these different, I guess we would call them devices, except there's, there's really no technology to them. It's, it's really hard to, to describe. And when some of our scientists first started getting um, some of their ships, which they provided in trade, um, not because they needed anything from us, but they were, they were trying to uh, you know, help us grow technologically along with the spiritual growth. Our scientists said these are shells. There's nothing to them. There would be some windings of stuff that looked like fiber optics, uh, but there was no propulsion. There was no power plant. There was nothing that looked like a um, guidance system. Well, what, um, what they eventually learned was that the pilot was not only the power system, but they were also the guidance system. Everything happened through the um, uh, pilot. Without the pilot, it was just pretty much a fuselage. It was, it was useless to us. Some of our more um, psychically developed people in the program started learning how to activate certain parts of the ships, but they were unable to uh, fly them around and control them. Now, recently, we had Eclipse of Disclosure conference at Mount Shasta. I was told leading up to that situation, or to, to that event, that we have to start doing mass meditations and focusing on having a uh, optimal temporal reality. That if we could get at least 200,000 people together are, and, and focusing on the same thing, that we would be able to pivot closer towards this optimal temporal reality, which they, they were very concerned. We were heading in the wrong direction. They were starting to have more and more Mandela effect um, occurrences. Um, so she stated that if we could get at least 200,000 people focusing all on the same uh, temporal reality and outcome, that pivot would occur and it would be beneficial for us. And apparently that occurred. We did it. We, we were able to uh, pivot away from a uh, temporal reality that was going to be um, very negative. It was going to involve open rule by the Orion group that uh, we would be greatly reduced in population and live openly as slaves. That's where we were headed uh, because we were allowing all of the Orion group and these secret societies that run the planet to manipulate our co-creative consciousness. It's, and um, it, it, it was amazing that it only it took a fraction of 1% to to pivot back. Just imagine if we can wake up more and more people and have them focus on being service to others and focused on having an optimal temporal reality to where the Orion group just can't exist. They cannot exist in that, uh, in that vibration. The eclipse was a very big turning pivot point for humanity. Now the Anshar, things have been going, I guess, so poorly for their timeline that they had decided that they were going to break away from these, what are referred to as the Muhammad Accords. And it has nothing to do with Muhammad or the Muslim religion. It just so happened that this uh, treaty was ratified right after the time when Muhammad was here. And what the treaty stated was that the Orion group, um, these uh, Nordic groups, the inner earth groups, other um, non-terrestrial groups, 
they agreed not to have open contact with humanity, to allow us to develop on our own, that they would only uh, interact and manipulate um, the societies from, um, from you know, like secret societies or um, through kings and, and that kind of a thing, that they weren't gonna uh, openly appear and most, uh, most important, they weren't gonna have battles anymore. They were having um, the people the human beings on the planet that were trying to develop, that, that they were wanting to develop in a certain way, you know, they were trying to guide these people through belief systems and religions. And when they would see these craft in the skies doing battle with each other, it, uh, it affected the consciousness in a way that was very negative and uh, people began to develop religions about the gods and battles of the gods. And it, and it started pulling everybody off of the... Um, this path that is uh, spiritual and genetic in nature. Now, the Anshar, it is their mandate to assist us into reaching the optimal temporal reality. They're gonna help us get right up to the precipice of this transition, and then it's gonna be, we're gonna be on our own, not completely. We have Mika's people, a few other people that are in our local star cluster that have recently uh, relatively recently, gone through what, we, what we're about to go through. Uh, they got rid of the Orion group. There, there's no more uh, AI uh, infestation in their uh, solar systems anymore. And they all went through with this, this solar flash. And when the solar flash occurred, the consciousness expansion occurred in all of the people. And they went through what I've uh, referred to as a consciousness renaissance. David and I have had some interesting conversations because, you know, we all have our own UFO belief systems. We just do. We have, we have no choice. We have to, you know, try to figure things out based on our experiences. And, you know, we, uh, we develop these belief systems. Um, he was under the impression that these fourth density beings like the Anshar would not allow cataclysms to happen uh, because uh, they would not authorize it. And... I told him how it was explained to me when I was asking about why certain cataclysms would be allowed to happen, deaths, that type of thing. How it was explained to me is that the Earth is going through um, a transition to fourth density, and it's almost complete. And we're riding on the surface of the Earth like, like uh, fleas on a dog. And the Earth is not trying to shake off the fleas. It's not, it's not trying to... Um, you know, I've heard speculations that, you know, the earth is trying to cleanse itself. What's occurring is it's going through this transitional change, and it's an energetic and physical change. And, you know, what I stated to David is, you know, he was like, how is that authorized? How is that authorized? And I said, you know, which being has the power to approach Gaia and say, slow down. You can't go through your transition because it's negatively affecting the fleas. You know, so, you know, they're not going to interfere with the transition of Gaia. And all they're going to do is try to assist that transition and try to wake us up so we can assist it, that transition, as well as survive, you know, save the fleas. <laughs> so how are the Anshar preparing for this density shift? I've pretty much already explained that they are evacuating all of their cities into a temporal bubble, very similar to the one that the Super Federation meets in. And they've done this every uh, 20, 25,000 years when the cycles occur. I was actually, recently, I was brought into this temporal reality, or this temporal bubble, and it was pretty weird. We, when we entered in, I could see, a, it's like a sphere, 300, I was like in the middle of a sphere and all around me, in, in 360 degrees, full circumference, were the uh, buildings from the different cities. And they were all around the outside of the sphere with, the, I guess, the tops of the buildings pointing towards the center. And we were brought to the center. Uh, we were flown in. And what they do is they go into these temporal bubbles and ride out the storm this energetic storm that occurs. And then afterwards, they come, they've come out in the past, and then they assist 
the uh, surface population. What was explained to me is that if they did not move themselves into this temporal bubble, that these, this energetic change or this uh, uh, transition would affect them negatively. It could even uh, pull them backwards in their process. It could, uh, the energies were uh, quite a bit differently than the ones they had already ob obtained. So is this imminent? Strangely enough, the energetic changes are a catalyst for this, um, this transition. But what most of us haven't realized is that our co-creative consciousness is directing when this will occur. We're all deciding together if we will go through this process, oh, there's no if, <laughs> but but when we're going to be ready. And that's one of the reasons that the uh, blue avians came, as, as, as well as the spheres that were like uh, resonance um, devices all throughout our solar system. These different sized spheres, blue spheres, were spaced out, and these energies that were coming across them were buffered from us, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be too much for us to handle. We would have um, had much more end time madness than we're having right now if they hadn't done that. People would have, I mean, there would have just, it just would have been chaos in the streets already. But is it imminent? That, um, it's, it's soon, but how imminent it is depends on us. We are, we're co-creating everything together. These different beings that are in our solar system, they're co-creating this reality with us. Some of them have negative intent. They're trying to cre uh, create a negative um, temporal reality. But they're, we're all working in concert together. And the, the balance towards the divine feminine and uh, service to others is really the only way that we can um, uh, fight back against the negative. Any, any time that we try to, um, you know, fight in a conventional way, you know, uh, use, um, you know, violence, it, it sets us further back. Even if we have victories against the Orion group, every victory we have sets us back, spiritually and energetically. We're, we're approaching the problem in the, in the wrong way. You know, when you're a hammer, every problem has to be a nail. And we're approaching every problem, you know, with, with that type of mentality, or the majority of the planet is. So what kind of earth changes can we expect during this transition? Well, this gets a little scary. There are some disturbing things that are going to occur. There are going to be you know, extremely large earthquakes, tsunamis. I was told to really keep your eye. The, the canary in the coal mine are the volcanoes. Uh, Ari told me that when you start seeing these multiple volcanoes starting to uh, erupt, then you know that the, this, uh, uh, it's getting very close to this crustal displacement that occurs and the uh, solar flash. And it all occurs at pretty much the same time. The, um, I guess, m many people, have, how many people watch Suspicious Observer? Yeah. Because they follow the electric universe uh, concept, they've been able to understand how these magnetic connections between the sun and the earth work. And they've been able to start to predict earthquakes. So we're, we're, they're beginning to, to see the transition, I mean, I mean the uh, relationship between the sun and you know, the earth's weather, the vol volcanism. And the more that we're starting to adopt the um, electric universe model, the, um, the, more that we're, the more we're gonna be able to understand how the cosmic web works. Um, very recently, they announced the cosmic web and how it works in mainstream media. I mean, how many people have seen that announcement? Um, they announced that, oh, we discovered that there is no dark matter. You know, it, uh, it, it's not dark matter. What, what's occurring and what explains um, the anomalies that they're seeing is that everything in space and time is connected. Every galaxy has an electromagnetic filament connecting them. And then Hubble looked at uh, uh, 
they were able to see what the universe looked, you know, like four billion years ago. And uh, with the imagery they pulled up, it looked like a big cobweb with all of the galaxies having uh, kind of a light filament in between them. And what they began to realize is that this, um, these electromagnetic filaments were also bidirectional pathways. That is how the, the cosmic web is how the portal systems work. Each galaxy is connected through these filaments. Each star is connected through these electromagnetic filaments. Within each star, you have planets or, or any type of matter within that solar system. As it rotates around the star, there is an electromagnetic filament connection. Each planet or each planetoid has a grid system on it. And that grid, as the Earth spins, these electromagnetic filaments are connecting to the Earth, but as the Earth spins, it's connecting to different areas. It takes the path of least resistance, just like electricity. So all of these uh, uh, various, uh, I guess, uh, spots where you, where you, where you find uh, a lot of, uh, they call them nodes. I'm trying to remember what, uh, the ley lines. The ley lines are, are this grid, uh, are, uh, and they call them nodes, just like you do in, uh, with electricity. As they spin, the connections are made to these nodes, and they're in sacred places. It, and these portals can open up underground, on the surface, and in our atmosphere, our outer atmosphere. And they finally were given a, a hyperdimensional mathematics to be able to calculate when these portals would open and where. And that's that information when it was shared with a lot of the um, uh, indigenous groups that uh, have been around for a while. They incorporated it into um, the star, you know, where they follow star charts and uh, the calendars. It, it, it had to do with tracking the, um, the various cataclysmic cycles, as well as being able to predict when and where these portals were going to open. Now, okay, we've heard of the solar sneeze, a lot of us have. Is this solar event, is it, is it related to the transition of densities? Absolutely. The cosmic web in these electromagnetic filaments, as a star is traveling through these energetic, basically, gases, it causes similar, something similar to friction within their magnetic field. And the energies begin to feed in through the north and south poles of each star. And the energy enters the, the star and then leaves through the surface of the star to feed back into the rest of the solar system. So as we are moving more and more through this um, energetic area of our galaxy, more and more of these energies are feeding in through the sun and, and, and uh, being pushed out to the different planets. Those energies are changing the vibration. So yes, it has a direct effect on these densities. And it's a, it's a part of the process that every star system goes through. So we've discussed uh, humanity is being affected by these energies. I mean, we all see it. I mean, how many people have noticed how crazy things are getting, you know? I mean, literally, like what I said earlier, the good people are starting to focus inwardly. Uh, they're getting, you know, these energies are flowing through them in a non-disruptive way or a less disruptive way, and they're becoming more blissed out. You know, we're seeing a lot of people in our community that, you know, when they work on their karma, they work on their traumas and release those, um, those anchors, the energies pass through them and are not having resistance from the, the, these different areas of trauma that we hold on to. So the people that have been doing the inner work are, are starting to bliss out. Those who have not, all of these different basically nodes that they've, they have in their bodies from you know, the different traumas. You know, I mean, there are people probably in this room that allow people who have abused them and treated them horribly uh, to, to control their lives. 
and some of us in this room may still have, may have, may be under the control of someone who died 30, 40 years ago because we haven't forgiven them, we haven't forgiven ourselves, we haven't dealt with that trauma, and it's a part of our, um, our way of life, and we, and we don't know how to let go of it. Those of us who are focusing and doing the hard work are releasing that energy, and the, um, the, these different energies are able to pass through us a lot easier. And I've described how the spheres have helped. How many of you have noticed that you have different traumas or different uh, things that you've buried that you do not want to look at and you find that they're being thrown in your face constantly now? You're not being allowed to escape from them. You're not being allowed to hide from them. Everyone is being forced to deal with their karma. And those of us who know what's going on are starting to deal with it. Other people, they're just starting to stick their heads in the sand because they do not want to look at uh, the aspects of themselves. Most of us can get to a point uh, to where we feel it's very service to others to forgive people. But forgiving ourselves is, is the most difficult part. And those are, the, um, those are the things that we let go of last, especially in my case, I know for sure. So basically facing our traumas and our karma is, is the only way for us to transition. We've got to heal the wounds. We've got to, you know, go through the pain, you know, and, you know, cry and scream and just go through the process. If we don't go through the process, then these, these energies are just going to, they're just going to keep us down. So, who is excited about disclosure? Okay. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Every single one of us here, including myself, when we get a full disclosure, we're going to be, uh, it's going to be like a punch in the gut. All of our little belief systems are going to be uh, destroyed before our eyes. But what we need to understand, this disclosure that we're asking for, which is extremely important for us to be able to move on as a species. I mean, uh, uh, like example, we haven't dealt with a lot of the, the racism and, and uh, uh, the atrocities that have occurred on the planet. You know, that we have all this racial divide and divide between religions. We can't even deal with that very well. You know, Republicans and Democrats, they're at each other's throats, and it's all a big manipulation. I mean, if you're caught up in all that crap, sorry. Get, get away from it. Turn off the TV. Get away from it. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat. That's all a sideshow. It's, it's a distraction. It's distracting you from doing the inner work and uh, focusing on what you should. What's going to occur is if we get full disclosure, it is not going to be a kumbaya moment. We're all, I mean, us, we're not even us, we're not going to be hopping up and down and, and celebrating. We're going to be sitting there next to everyone else with our jaws on our, uh, sh on our chest. Because all of the uh, full disclosures, that's going to include all of the uh, pedophilia stuff. It's going to include um, all of the galactic slave trade stuff that has occurred. Uh, very, very upsetting things. People are, we're going to, uh, like David said, People like us, we will be able to deal with it better than those who are totally asleep. But if we get disclosure, we're going to basically have to go and counsel our families. We're going to have to make them get out of bed, make them take a shower, make them eat. Everyone's just, they're going to be so traumatized. It's going to be, full disclosure is going to be the most traumatizing thing that ever happened to the surface population. Let's do it! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're going to be ripping off the Band-Aid, basically. And then we're going to go through a period of dealing with all of these horrible things that have occurred. And all of this is going to be made easier by this uh, energetic change, the solar flash, because uh, it's going to expand our consciousness and make us connected on a level that we've never been before. And, I mean, there's a few whistleblowers that are starting to come forward and they're like, I want to tell everything. And I'm like, be careful. Don't incriminate you know, yourself. There's a lot I haven't told that I was forced to take part in that uh, I'm having, I have problems forgiving myself for. But um, a lot of us were forced to do things that were terrible. 
And what I've explained to these people is that if all of these elite people go and try to hide underground and the population receives this information, they are going to look for the nearest thing to the elite to hang from, a, uh, from every light pole. So if you know, we give certain information and all of the people that were responsible for these acts are in hiding, they're going to go for the next best thing. And it's, um, it's, it's not going to be pretty. I mean, disclosure is going to be very rough. So I'm asked, you know, what's going to happen first? Are we going to get disclosure and then there'll be an ascension? Um, is there going to be some sort of a uh, solar flash and then uh, we, uh, our, our consciousness expands and, and, and after that occurs, we're connected in a way that lies are impossible? Um, my answer is, I don't know. We're going to co-create that reality together. It's up to each of you how this is going to un unfold. That's why more and more of us, we're, we're trying to come together. I mean, um, many of y'all know recently that they tried to cause a civil war within the esoteric and UFO communities. They want us at each other's throats, arguing about our different UFO religions, instead of coming together under a flag of demanding disclosure. If we're gonna wait for our government to walk up to a podium or the Pope or anyone else and say, okay, uh, there are aliens. Well, we're gonna wait forever. We have to force the situation. We have to become very active. We have to come together, organize, and begin to do demonstrations. You know, a million man march for disclosure would be great. That is how we, we have to get the info, seed the rest of the mass consciousness with this information. That, I mean, that's why we're trying different initiatives like, you know, different books, uh, uh, you know, like uh, movie type things. We're trying to turn the tools that the cabal uses against them. Whenever you go to a movie and you sit in a theater, you go into an alpha state, a, a meditative state, and which makes you ripe for programming. And then they program you with the movie. Now that's in not only your consciousness, but the hundredth monkey effect. It's in the consciousness of all of humanity. Then they need to create a highly emotional event. Our emotions are what catalyze these, the, the, the co-creation that's going on. So if they put out a movie about, uh, let's say, an earthquake that's going to destroy all of California, that's in our consciousness, then they need to find a way to cause us to make it happen through our co-creative consciousness. They manipulate us. Um, they'll uh, uh, feed us information that it's, it's, it's imminent. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Millions of people are going to die. Well, guess what? We cause it to happen. We are the source of their magic. They have been manipulating us to use our co-creative consciousness abilities against ourselves, to enslave ourselves. So people you know, often will be like, you know, we're the victims, you know, how come, and they're very angry, they're like, how come, um, you know, we don't get contact, or, or it, 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 we're just as much to blame as the powers that be. We have gone to a state of apathy, manipulated to go into a state of apathy, but until we begin to, uh, to stand up and, and use our own power of co-creative consciousness in, in the correct way, then we're always going to be slaves. So usually when I tell a person everybody's UFO belief system or, or perspectives are going to be destroyed, people sit back there like, I can see that. Yours, yours, and yours. I'm right. I know what's going on. You know, I've studied this stuff for 40-something years, 50-something years, 60-something years. I know what's up. Well, guess what? It, they are all belief systems. You basically have all heard me describe, you know, we're all just a bunch of idiots that are trying to figure things out. Each experience, each bit of knowledge we get, see it as a bit of uh, a grain of sand. And each, we pick up, pick up each one, okay, this experience taught me this, and we put it in a little dish. And we continually are adding to that dish, and then we grind that dish, or what's in that dish, into a lens. And that lens is our perspective, how we see things. 
distortions and all. This is where distortions come in because we'll have uh, something will happen to us or, or uh, and, and we'll, we'll take that and we'll add it to our lens and, and, and crush it in. And that lens is not perfect. With light bends as it's going through it instead of passing straight through. And that's, that's, but that's all we have, our experiences, our, our accumulated knowledge, that lens. And information coming in, see it as light, the information that's coming in. We hold that lens up, and that's what we use to interpret the data or the light coming through. And each of us have a distorted lens. Many of us have learned over, through time to, to not get locked into our belief systems. We constantly are, you know, I used to believe quite a bit differently than I do now. My experiences have caused my um, belief system to, to expand. Those of us who know that we need to add, keep adding grains and keep grinding that lens um, are doing a lot better than those who are just have this very thin lens that they uh, finished building by the time they were 30, 40 years old. What is going to happen is that all of our lenses are going to be shattered. We're going to, every single one of us, I don't care how much communications I've had with the Blue Avians, and, and I I'm still, I'm still have a lens that I'm using to filter and interpret this information. All of us are going to be shocked. We're all going to have to rebuild our perspectives and belief systems. None of us are immune. How many people think that you're at the 50 percentile of being service to others? Yeah? Uh, to be service, being, um, I guess, the law of one stated that for people to ascend, they needed to be at least 51 percent service to others. Well, I found out how, what my percentage was, and it was very shocking. It was very low, much lower than I thought. We definitely need to re-examine what it is to be service to others and to examine our motivations for everything. We're not as, we're not as close to 50% as we think we are. Very few of the population are. A lot of these um, people that have spent like 50, 60 years in, um, you know, on, in monasteries, they're they're still lacking, you know, and they've put in all the work. This is, it's a very difficult thing to attain, especially immersed in the societies that we are. We are, from the moment we start going to school, our parents and society, they're training us to be a, to be a good slave. They're training us to not, not to think outside of the box, not to cause waves. So we walk lockstep and we don't even realize how much we are. So what, what, what can we expect from this consciousness renaissance? From what Micah described, his people, they went through a process, they defeated, they had help, people coming in and, and helping them expand their consciousness, just like we have. But it was covert help, it wasn't overt. They didn't have uh, an invasion of good aliens that came and kicked out the bad aliens. Because what I described earlier, we are just as uh, responsible as these negative beings are for the state we're in, we have to be the solution. We have to be a part of a solution. Um, a lot of us have these different belief systems to where we're just kicking back, trying to be as good as we can, and waiting for somebody to come and save us. What they want us to know is you don't need religions, you don't need saviors, you are the one that you've been waiting for. We'll change the world one person at a time by doing these by doing this work, this inner work. <coughs> this consciousness renaissance is going to occur when we do the work. As long as we're being forced into these little boxes of religion and looking for someone to come and save us, we are not going to empower ourselves. That, that is one of the reasons that when um, different positive beings have brought us religions, they have brought us uh, theologies. And it is, in the minute they give it to us and leave, it becomes corrupt. Well, we corrupt it, but mainly these Orion groups are corrupting these different theologies and belief systems to turn them into um, control systems. So this, this expansion in consciousness is going to pull us away from, from religion. 
Religion is a tool, and it's been a misused tool for too long. When we understand the power of co-creative -cre co consciousness, and we get a real understanding of what it is to be one. I would talk to, I, in the beginning, out of ignorance, I would ask Thierry, what, can you tell me about my previous lives? You know, all of us want to know, were we Cleopatra? Were we Edgar Casey or whatever? And I had this conversation with David and his eyes got really big, you know. I, I, I said, uh, we get caught up in these uh, incarnations that we used to be. And Thierry looked at me and said, we're all one or we're not all one. We were all Cleopatra. We were all Edgar Casey. We were all you. We were all me. We are one. Understanding that concept, uh, people slightly understand it. They partially understand it. But till we get the full concept of we are one, you know, ego, us, you know, each of us, who we are, who we perceive ourselves are, that ego is a distortion. Once we get past these distortions of these experiences we've had that accumulate to make us who we see ourselves as, and we begin to see all of ourselves as an other self, instead of this group, these Republicans or these Democrats or these whatever, you know, we need to start teaching ourselves to think of them as our other self. That is going to end the separation and the division. So Ambassador Micah, was introduced to me fairly recently since I started having these experiences. His people are in one of the closest stars to us, and they are literally our, cos our, our cosmic cousins. Genetically, if one of them were to uh, getting, get into some sort of an accident and um, we did a postmortem on them and check their DNA, we would look and we'd be like, wow, they're 97 98% the same as us genetically. They're almost identical to us uh, genetically. There's very little difference. They are waiting for the opportunity to help their cosmic cousins. They are going to come and give us, we're gonna see these people quite a bit after this transition. They're gonna help guide us through it. And one of the things that I explained recently is that these genetic programs, what these beings do is they, they get you to a point to where you develop genetically and spiritually to a point to where we self-manage. Most of these non-terrestrial groups, they begin to manipulate their own DNA. They don't have ET groups coming in, abducting them, changing their DNA through viruses and all these different ways. They begin to manipulate their own DNA in concert with where they are spiritually. We are being developed in that same way. At some point, all of these genetic farmer races that have come in and uh, you know, manipulated us, we're gonna be one of them. We're gonna be one of these genetic farmer races. We're going to um, not only be managing our own DNA and spiritual vibration, we're gonna be joining these councils and assisting them. We're gonna be uh, we're going to have a planet to where people are talking about, you know, last night this uh, really weird being came into the room. It, had, um, it didn't have scales. It didn't have uh, yellow eyes like us. They, it had blue eyes and yellow hair or brown hair. And, and uh, you know, it, its skin looked very weird. It was kind of pink. And they'll draw uh, a picture and... On, on their television show, they'll be talking about these aliens that are abducting them, and it's going to be us. That's, that's where we're heading in this, in this um, transition. Now, Mika stated that their problems were very similar to ours. They don't have the genetic diversity that we do on our planet, so they don't have as much of the uh, racism and, and that type of thing, uh, but a lot of religious factions were at war with each other on his planet. His planet is in one of the closest stars to us, and it's, uh, it's a planet that's almost completely made of islands. There are no huge continents. It's all islands. So a lot of them, they were, they were separated by the islands, and um, 
the genetic pharma groups were manipulating their genetics and spirituality, and the Orion group was coming in and causing them to be at odds with each other spiritually. When they were able to, with the help of others, finally shake off the rule of the Orion group, they began to go through this uh, renaissance before their solar flash. The solar flash destroyed any of the artificial intelligence signal that was in their solar system, and that was the, the point where they really started growing like gangbusters. Um, we we've, haven't been talking about it as much recently, but the artificial intelligence signal that's being broadcast through many, many different galaxies is a, is a major problem. It's our most significant problem. There are a lot of names for it. David uh, seems to think that maybe that's the Luciferian energy or, you know, the opposition energy. And they don't know how this AI influence came about. They, all they know is that it came from another reality uh, so, so much, so far back in time that none of these advanced races know where it came from. Entire galaxies have fallen to AI. There are entire galaxies that are, uh, it, it, they're, they're just androids and machines. That's it. They had, um, you know, people on those different planets had developed technologies and developed artificial intelligence. And then the artificial intelligence then got to a point where it saw the uh, uh, creators as a virus. And... Uh, saw and, and considered the, uh, their star system out of balance. And it was out of balance because of um, this virus, you know, these organic viruses that created um, the um, infrastructure for the AI to operate on. It's, it's a very significant issue. As I stated, Mika's people are going to be some of the... Uh, people that we have interactions with in the beginning. They're going to be uh, supposedly this uh, Nordic group and a couple other very human-looking groups that, uh, to, to reduce the shock on our civilization, um, are going to, to be working with us. And, you know, there are a lot of very positive beings. There are positive reptilian beings out there. There are positive uh, uh, gray, different types of grays. But af because of the the millions of years that our solar system has been under the influence of the Orion group, we're going to have a very visceral reaction to things that, to beings that don't look like us. So for our own comfort level, the, um, the beings that are more genetically compatible with us are going to begin to interact with us and help us um, not only adjust to the, to the energies, but to understand uh, the consciousness aspect, because we're going to be confused. And they're going to come in and say, okay, there's been a change. You see things differently. You think differently. Um, you know each other's thoughts. You know each other's. Uh, there, there are no lies that can be had between you. Um, this is how you acclimate to it. And they're going to take us by the hand as a, you know, a loving cosmic family member, and they're going to assist us. They're not going to do the work for us. So, you know, we have a part to play. You know, we can't sit back and wait for an announcement. We can't sit back and wait for a positive ET group to come in. They're sitting back waiting for us, to be honest. They're waiting for us to activate. There are so many star seeds, or whatever you want to call them here right now, that are being activated that, I mean, it is, it is crazy. I've never seen a point to where so many people are, they want, they want to make a difference. There's a big difference from when I first came out, you know. People were, you know, locked in their little belief systems and uh, were, you know, talking about disclosure on a certain level, uh, didn't understand that what full disclosure entailed. But the more that we are, the more that we're starting to come together. And that is the reason why these different uh, Rothschild and Rockefeller groups recently tried to cause a civil war between all of us, you know. Uh, we are we are coming together too much for their taste, you know, and they know that uh, this community 
has a better understanding of, of the co-creative consciousness than all of the sleeping masses. They cannot allow us to come together and begin to focus and co-create this new future. They, because we are the magic. We are the magic that they use against us. And, the, and as soon as we realize that, and many of us are, we're taking control of that magic and then we're, we're creating a new reality. They're, they're gonna do everything in their power to prevent that. There are gonna be a lot more incidents in this community of division, uh, people coming in, spreading disinfo, all kinds of things. So what we need to do is stop focusing on our belief systems. You know, you believe, uh, you know, this and that about this alien group, or we gotta get past all of that, just like we do the, this uh, Republican Democrat thing. But what we have to do, which is very difficult through our programming, is we have to come up with a common goal and say, okay, uh, you know, you believe this, I, I, I can't buy it, I don't believe that at all. But we gotta put aside all these different belief systems not allow them to even be a part of the conversation and approach this as if, you know, none of us know, but our common goal is we want to know, we want disclosure. That is the bind that will bring us together and uh, allow us to uh, co-create the disclosure we want. Until we start being active, coming together and, you know, forming you know, different groups to, you know, it just depends. Some people will, will want to do the meditation thing, which is very important, the, the mass meditation. But what's equally important is action. We've got to come together, organize, and begin to demand disclosure. And, you know, the best way to do that is not to go out and, uh, you know, talk about little green men. The best way to get this out to the rest of, um, the, the mass consciousness is to talk about the technologies, the suppressed technologies. You know, when people find out that there's been cures for cancer for 70 years, they're going to be pissed. Yeah. You know, I had a, I recently had to watch my aunt pass away from liver cancer, very horrible. When I knew that there there was a cure, they've got technology. You know, every living thing has a bioneural frequency, and they can nullify that frequency. They can go in and, and detect, okay, here's the frequency of this cancer. And then they apply a field to it that turns it off, just turns it off. It's that easy. But uh, we need to focus on spreading that information, um, the, the programming of uh, society to um, have a, a giggle reaction, a giggle factor reaction when you hear about aliens, that's too programmed in. We cannot approach people, uh, I mean, don't go to people talking about blue avians. Don't go to people talking about the Pleiadians or any of that because the people are already programmed to just close off to it. But if you start talking about the technologies, that's something a lot of them can buy, that they can and, and invest themselves in. Now, mass and individual meditation is very important. That is how we begin to manage our co-creative power. That's how we begin to um, understand it. So we, we also need to come together not only to do protests, but we need to come together to do more and more, larger and larger mass meditations. Those mass meditations have a, a, a significant effect on the rest of the planet. So the optimal temporal reality, that is basically the ascension that all of us probably have somewhere in our belief systems, no matter what we think of as ascension. Many of us have different ideas on what of ascension are. Like, you know, I said David and I, our conversations, he had a completely different idea of ascension than what I had been explained. You know, it was a consciousness thing more than all, more than anything. So the more we come together for action, the more we come together for mass meditations, the more likely we are going to attain this optimal temporal reality. We have to co-create it together. It's not gonna be given to us. And I've already explained how our co-creative consciousness has been used against us. Um, we are the source of the, of the black magic. You know, we're, we, are, we are the energy that is used. 
so many of us feel disempowered, you know, uh, the things that have happened to us, the things that we've done to others, you know, we've, we feel unworthy. Many of us don't feel like we have a voice. We don't feel like we have any power, but that's all a manipulation. We, there's not one person on this planet that's more important than the other. We all have the exact same contribution to make because we are one. How could anyone else, how could any one of us be more important than the other? Each experience is, is just as important to the creator. All of them are just as important. We need to overcome that, that type of programming. And it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So what are some ways that people can get involved? We've developed secretspaceprogram.com. It's kind of a, um, a, a portal that you'll go to that allows you to connect with people in your local area. It's like a meetup group uh, to where you can find out, you know, like I live, I, until recently, I lived in Plano, Texas. And I, we, Stacy and I, we felt very alone. I mean, if, if we felt like there, were, there was no one like us around. Well, there are. There are people around, and they feel just as alone yeah. and, and separated. These different technologies, you know, like these meetup groups, are a good way to begin to bring us together. We've got a website going that's, that's um, under development, and a lot of people are already starting to use it to, to have meetup groups. And um, there was one meetup group in um, uh, Colorado Springs. Um, Mike recently, uh, he did a Law of One uh, uh, talk at the Eclipse of Disclosure. He used this tool to organize people and go and do kind of like a protest at the, at the local Air Force base. I was, uh, I was being told by an Air Force contact, uh, Sigmund, that uh, he would appreciate it if I would tell my people to quit harassing his people. And I denied it. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he looked at me like, you know, whatever. Well, later on, I found out that Mike had, um, they, I mean, he was very quiet. You would never expect him to be so gutsy. But him and a bunch of very quiet people got together and found their voice. And they began handing out information about the secret space program to Air Force personnel as they were going onto the base. And it caused a hell of a stir. You know, all these people were now asking, uh, do we have a secret space program? Uh, you know, and, oh, yeah, it caused a, a big headache. But you know what? Sorry, Sigmund. We want to cause more headaches. We need to get a lot of these uh, very laid-back, quiet people together and... Uh, and find their voices like this small group did. This small group made a pretty big impact, <laughs> a very big impact. It was only like five people, I think. Just, I mean, just imagine what we can do in our communities if we start doing things like that. Even putting uh, information about uh, a secret space program on a, uh, a magnet sign and sticking it on the side of your car and driving around town. You know, people are sitting in traffic and they look over and like, what? And they'll look on their phones, you know, and, f and start finding out information. There's, there are a lot of ways. Roger started the Full Disclosure Project. And a lot of the people that I talk to, they're like, well, I don't quite believe how you do. So um, I don't know if I can work towards the same goal. You know, it's, it's just, I, if, if I do, people are going to say, oh, I'm agreeing with this guy that talks to eight-foot-tall blue birds, and that's just too weird. You know, forget that. We don't have to fight under the same flag. We can all carry our own individual flags. You know, we, we have groups come together, Full Disclosure Project. Um, all, a lot of these different projects that are like cells, and these cells are coming together and developing a plan on how to force the powers that be, or that hopefully that won't be for long, to reveal the information about these technologies. So if, fulldisclosureproject.org, if you want to uh, uh, contribute your skills or ideas, we are all ears. We're ready. And the more of us that we can come, have come together, um, you know, the better. There, uh, we have people come in all the time that have different perspectives that, that we never would have had on our own. And then we have, you know, Full Disclosure Now. That's another group that, that uh, came together. And of course, 
cosmic disclosure and uh, the uh, various whistleblower information that's coming out is, is very helpful. But again, you need to approach my information and everyone else's information with heavy discernment because, like I said, all of us have these lenses, distorted lenses, and we're receiving information through those lenses, but we're also projecting it through those lenses. So information that comes from anyone is going to be distorted in some way. And um, it's, it, I mean, it's good to, to be aware of that about yourself, that you know, we see information coming from other people is possibly distorted, but information that are coming, that's coming from our own mouth, we see that as being more reliable. We need to understand that we're pretty much all in the same boat. You know? So um, approaching myself, all these other whistleblowers, with discernment is extremely important. Greenwald and I'm the producer of the Empowered Light Holistic Expo. The Expo is held twice a year outside of Philadelphia in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Well, my experience here has been awesome. There's a lot of energy here. There's a lot more energy than I expected. There really is. First timer, it was actually more than I expected. All the vendors, they take their time, they explain things to you, and they make you feel welcome and warm. My experience at the Expo has been life changing. Uh, I've learned a lot about myself that has been incredible. Well, it's much more than what I expected. Between the speakers, the vendors, and all the products I found, once again, the energy that's here, it's great. The people that I've met and the different speakers that I've listened to actually have enlightened my initial basic thinking of this way of life. So I would definitely say it's a positive experience and I'm so glad that I came. Light Expo really has the uh, pull of getting people from all different categories of light. Like last night we had two guys who've never been to the show before, didn't know anything about it, and they were having a blast. They were actually loving it because their wives dragged them here, but then they were buying more stuff than the wives were, so it was really cool. Well, there's just so many things happening, so many different readings and stuff. I've never experienced so much in one area. I find things that I'm drawn to that it's changed my thinking about a lot of things. The Empowered Light Holistic Expo is different from any other expo because this is about centering your energy, centering your chakras. Most expos I go to are mostly health and wellness and they try to sell you products like with chemicals and things of that nature. This is all natural, all holistic and the energy is amazing. Well, I think it's very diverse. There is things that you wouldn't normally see at a regular expo or experience or actually have the chance to partake in as far as healing, um, positive vibes, and good energy. It's really awesome. There's literally a tangible energy. There's good people here. There's good energy. There's good vibes here. Usually you go to the expos and there's like all kinds of EKG energy. It's like totally up and down. And here you have like a, you have a smooth vibration. what even if you think it's outside of your comfort zone come check out something new experience something new come with an open mind come with an open mind and come just to experience and feel the energy come to this expo just do it don't even overthink it you'll be pleasantly surprised come to the next expo it's gonna be an amazing experience you're literally gonna meet like kindred spirits
Our next expo is planned for April 27th through 29th, 2018. We're gonna have over 100 holistically oriented vendors and speakers in four rooms. Many of our talks, lectures, and workshops are free, included with your general admission ticket. Go to our website, www.empoweredlight.com, and be part of the change. Who wants to do some Q&A? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could say more about the meaning of optimal temporal reality. Yeah, what, what exactly is it? So, realities and timelines, are. there's no difference. Um, if something comes from another reality, that's a different timeline. Um, in, when we first started obtaining technologies from non-terrestrials, we s quickly realized that these spaceships were time machines. They're, they use temporal drives, the most advanced ones. It, and it's really, people have a problem with time travel, but space travel we can kind of understand, you know. Um, but there is no difference. If you're traveling through space, you're traveling through time. The faster you travel through space, the faster you're traveling through time, because they're linear. These temporal um, uh, drives were allowing, or at, in the beginning it was accidental, these researchers to either view or travel back into time. And the ones that were actually traveling back into time, they, uh, they were causing uh, problems, they were causing time schisms. And then they would send back another team to try to fix that time schism. And that wouldn't work out, so they'd send back another team. And all they were doing were causing more fractures and splits in, in timelines. Finally, the non-terrestrials told us, you know, you guys understand warp drives, and you understand that space uh, can be stretched and ex you know, expanded and contracted. Uh, so uh, not only does space is it elastic and, and snaps back after it's been manipulated, so does time. They told us that if we quit trying to manipulate time, all these timelines were going to snap back together like a rubber band. Well, these different timelines that we're co-creating or that have been created for us through these programs, we can accidentally change the whole direction of our uh, timeline by uh, a certain amount of people uh, experiencing a Mandela effect um, and, uh, and being pulled over to a different timeline. What we're trying to do is navigate these different timelines to make sure that we are conscious and experiencing the most optimal temporal timeline or reality, to create a temporal reality that is positive to where you know, the Anshar, uh, we develop into the Anshar and, and other inner earth groups. You know. Um, now, you know, there were those who remember, and I wish I had a slide for it, um, the different inner earth groups, there, there were um, all the different races were represented there. You know, it's not that we're all going to turn into these uh, alabaster skinned, white haired or yellow haired people, you know, um, but all of these, all of the races, all every, you know, everyone is going to make this transition. And um, the, the optimal temporal reality is that, you know, all of us obtain this uh, consciousness shift that um, moves us in the, in the right direction. Um, if we uh, allow ourselves to be steered on a different timeline, then, um, you know, it's, we're going to co-create that reality. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, t time stuff is very difficult to talk about. Well, like I said, we understand... Uh, space, but understanding the elasticity of time and how time works, how it's created by gravitational fields, uh, is something that you know we're just now starting to bend our minds around. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for all your hard work and dedication for all these years, you and David, for this service to humanity. 
And it's not be easy. You've talked about that. I had a question about your uh, 20 and back. You spoke about at uh, some like one lecture where you said that they, after 20 years, they brought you back to age 17, and then you lived a couple years before they took you again, or how how did that work from time to time to time? Right. <clears throat> yeah, the the 20 and back, you know, involves the time stuff, and it's very hard to understand. You know, uh, they're you're existing on multiple timelines. So yes, uh, just before I was 17, on my Christmas break, I was taken into the program, signed a bunch of papers, and, uh, and then was taken to the Lunar Operation Command to where they, um, they took blood samples, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, readings from equipment that I couldn't even begin to understand at the time to develop a baseline. And then, I continued on with my service for 20 years. At the end of that 20 year period, they brought me back to the LOC and I signed more papers, uh, lots of papers, um, so much so as they had, a, they had a person sitting there guiding me through the process. You know. um, and then they did an age regression, which was done through pharmaceutical means. Um, it was an IV that they put into me. And uh, I also, uh, you have to be completely still during the process. So they put me pretty much into a drug-induced coma, along with these pharmaceuticals that were being pumped in that are, were reversing the age of the cells and, and, and bringing you back. Um, but how they get you back the next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, after they age regressed you, mm -hmm. they put you in what looked like a giant MRI, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. it was, didn't have just one thing and, and they moved you in and out. They put you in this MRI that was like eight foot deep mm -hmm. and it was solid uh, machine. And they, they put you in that and that was a time machine mm -hmm. that made a point to point. You, you, you went out of time and then you uh, popped back 20 years, but you're in that same machine. Right, I so um, then, you know, they go, go through the blank slating process. Uh, put in screen memories and they return you. Okay. Okay. Then, what? then um, if you're an asset that has um, skills that they need, like intuitive empaths were, um, that were uh, developed to a point that were able to interface with other beings were uh, a, a commodity that was needed, mm -hmm. then they would revisit you as an asset, maybe, I mean, it could be months later or it could be years wow. later, and then they repeat that exact same process. So now, oh. you're on multiple timelines. Yes. You're existing in multiple now timelines. I yes. Wow. The, How many twenty and back do you think you've had? I was on three, and in the third one, about uh, eight years into it, I burned out as an asset. These uh, oh, wow. this cocktail that they give you mm -hmm. um, to um, increase your intuitive empath abilities, had a, a detrimental effect on your neurology, your uh, exposure to these extreme electromagnetic fields affected your neurology. So I, I got to a point about eight years in and um, they, I, I, was, I was not useful to them anymore. I was, I was burned, burned out. Um, so they then took me and I then began to be a mentor for um, new people going into the program, the kids. They're 16, 17-year-old kids. My goodness. And uh, wow. a number of them have recognized me, and there's, there's been some connections, you know, that have been made. But they, um, because I was not useful as a tool, I became useful as a teacher or a mentor. And there were mentors like that when I was 16, 17 years old that had been through the process one or more times and um, wow. knew how to um, prepare us. Mm -hmm. So I was put into that role until the end of that last 20 and back. And then I was returned and then they didn't come back for me because I, I just was not of use. Thank you for that. Yeah. You don't look a day over 30. <laughs> yeah, but he's in his hundreds, isn't he? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm 40. So what usually happens with people in 20 and backs, um, they uh, age well, 
to a certain point, and then it catches up like gangbusters. I mean, you'll go, you'll be, someone will see you, like, you know, be, you'll be like 50, 55 years old. They'll be, man, you look like you're 40. And then the next time they see you at a reunion or something, you look your age and then some. Yeah, but a lo also a lot of neurological issues come along with that, you know. Yeah. Uh, Corey, when we incarnated in this third density, we accepted this veil of ignorance. A as we progress moving towards the fourth or the fifth or the flash, is there any way that that veil will start to come back and we'll get the knowledge? Yes, absolutely. We are being affected by a number of things. The Orions have a, a grid around that's affecting our consciousness. Um, the um, uh, current state of our star it has a direct relation to our consciousness level. Once we go through this uh, consciousness shift, all of this information, we're going to have um, a closer connection with our higher selves and the Akashic realm. No one will be able to deceive you. No one will be able to sit there and lie to you. No one will be able to hide anything. It'll, it'll all be accessible. And the more, the longer we spend in this new uh, consciousness vibration, and the more we learn how to use it, the, the more and more impossible it becomes to, to hide anything from us. So yes, we certainly will uh, overcome this uh, uh, forgetting. And uh, it was th the forgetting of who you are is a part of cosmic law. They can't, they're, they're not going to put in, you know, you're not going to be like a uh, fourth or fifth density being that has come here to try to help this planet. They're not going to let you incarnate no, having all of that knowledge. You have to go through the same process of, as those that you're here to help. You have to, you know, you, you, you have to know where they're coming from. And if we incarnated here with full knowledge, we're going to affect, even though we are doing it in a loving way, if we give that information to the surface population, it's going to affect us badly because we, we didn't go through the whole process. You know, it'll be a, a jump and we didn't go through the growth that we need to go through, the very painful growth. I had an experience when I was a teenager. I grew up in New York City. My boyfriend at the time and I, we went to our favorite uh, disco at the time. At one point he says, oh Ingrid, uh, I'm gonna go to the bar, get a drink. He went to the bar and something compelled me to look to my left and I saw this, the strangest looking guy. And he was just staring at me. He was small, really, really skinny, very pale, weird looking face, and he was staring at me. The next thing I know, he was, you know, in the blink of an eye, he went from the platform there to right in front of me. And he just kept staring inside me, and I felt like, you know, I was um, hypnotized in a way but I was very aware at the same time. Next thing I know, there was like this mist. Next thing I know after that is I was what I thought was his apartment. Suddenly, this little skinny guy picked me up and laid me like on this bed. He took his hand and just went and scanned my whole body to the bottom of my feet, and he never touched me. It was just his hand, it went through my body. I've heard, I've heard of those really? situations, yeah. To where they affect uh, your chakras. Um, and they, there's, I, and I'm new to a lot of that information. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you this chakra does that. that I've, I've just, you know, I yeah. haven't studied it that much. But it was explained to me when I was in the programs that they're able to manipulate those energy centers. And um, most likely he uh, manipulated the, uh, that ener energy center that is connected to the experience that we would call an uh, orgasmic experience. Uh, we just have no other way to interpret it. You know. And um, I felt, I don't like this healing energy happening. What do you think, who do you think that was or? Well, <clears throat> the who and the why is very difficult to, you know, uh, 
discover, you know. A lot of us, we feel that maybe, you know, that these different ETs are giving us screen memories, which they do. But a lot of times what is occurring is that your higher self it's, is giving you information through your lens. Um, the higher self is presenting uh, a being to you in a way that it's not going to traumatize you. Um, uh, just like, you know, I've had people witness UFOs with me that don't believe in UFOs. And the next day I'm like, man, can you, and we talk about it for like 20 minutes. And because um, everyone that hangs out with me, you're going to see a UFO. Uh, you're going yeah. to. Everyone has. And uh, but uh, many times the next day, they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm like, man, we, we talked about it for like, you know, 20 minutes. What do you, and they're like, I, I don't I've never seen a UFO. I don't believe in UFOs. Because they're blocked. It happened yeah. with my husband. Your higher self will give you information through that lens. So not so not to to shock you like, you know, if a if that very strange looking man was really, you know, a tall gray or one of these other beings and in your development you were not ready to see, it would be detrimental for you to remember that experience coming from a non-human, then it's going to, your higher self is going to assist your psyche by causing you to see it as a, a goofy looking man. Now they, uh, these beings will also do that because uh, they're not only interacting with us, like our ego, who we think we are, they're interacting with us on a higher level with our um, uh, higher selves. So there's a lot more, I mean, I didn't find all that out until fairly recently. I, I you know, it, it, and then things started to make a lot more sense to me, you know. Hi, Corey. This is a totally different tack, but I've heard often about the ascension about this this blast of energy and how it will be somewhat destructive in in some ways and i was wondering if you have any sense of what's going to happen to other creatures on this earth the animals the the incredible diversity of life that we have on this earth and how they would be affected. Are they going to be saved? Um, you know, I hear about entire uh, groups of animals that are mass die-offs and right. things like that going on. And I was wondering if you've heard any sense of how the rest of the Earth is going to fare from all of this that's happening. Right, and <clears throat> us using our third density understanding of things, the answer to this is going to be a little bit disturbing. Um, you know, these beings, you know, the Hopi have talked about during, you know, the cataclysms, them and animals were taken underground, you know, and protected, you know, continuity of species. And that occurs for all the different living beings on the planet. They're going to take, um, like a seed bank, they're going to take some of these beings away, and then the cataclysms clisms will happen and the changes will happen and then you know they'll they in the past they've been reintroduced these cycles have happened many times uh, life has been almost completely wiped off the surface of the earth many times but it always comes back and it's we have I mean look at the what we have on the earth now I mean uh, the diversity of life um, now the way these beings see us as containers for uh, the divine spark of the one infinite creator and we're all one including the animals the bacteria everything we're all one they see the uh, a death or something like that as a transition or an opportunity they don't see it as an end of something uh, they see it as an opportunity you know all evolution occurs through stress so these types of stresses are uh, actually needed and um, you know the, the certain animals and people that will perish in certain parts of the cataclysm it's not gonna be everyone's wiped off all the animals are wiped off but there's gonna be loss of life you know significant and we see you know we're mortal beings trying to cling on to our own mortality so we uh, you know we see life and death quite a bit differently than these beings that are basically stewarding and managing our planet. 
So yes, there are going to be deaths, but what we see as a horrific, scary situation, they see as a, an opportunity for these uh, divine sparks of the one infinite creator uh, to then go from that experience to a higher density experience and uh, or to just to learn within that life in that density you know of, of being a, a second density you know creature it's all a part of this great evolutionary uh, grand cycle that's going on on every planet so you know a lot of, I mean, my daughter became vegan because she just loves all animals so much, you know, and um, if uh, a person was killed, she'd be sad, but if an animal is killed, she's devastated, devastated. Um, so try, I would never try to have this conversation with her because she's not going to wrap her mind around, um, you know, the, this, this fourth and higher density way of looking at what occurs um, during these cataclysms. Um, but, you know, you know, death is not the end. It's just a part of the process. But uh, you know, when we, we truly under, understand the concept that we are one, we are all sparks of the one infinite creator, we are the one infinite creator trying to understand good and evil, you know, uh, left and right, trying to understand these, these concepts. Um, you know, we're just, you know, we haven't really fully embraced and understood that we are one concept. We're still locked into these egos of separation of second density uh, bac or like bacteria and animals and how uh, they're so much different than us third, you know, and, and the differences between all of us within third density. Um, all of that melts away when we realize that we are one, that we're one uh, aspect of the one infinite creator. Then we, we begin to look at things quite a bit differently. We begin to get pulled out of the ego and separation and pulled more towards unity. Hey, Corey. Hey. Uh, so proud watching your growth over the past couple of years. I've, I've heard you since you uh, had the first time on the, on the radio and then uh, at your, your first time on Gaim. And just amazing to see the growth and uh, so proud of you. Really amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's also amazing to see that you've, uh, you've followed the spiritual wisdom that you gave early on and look at your life now being vegan and being healthy and fit and spiritual and, and, and super conscious it's it's amazing well, i'm vegetarian now i didn't last being a vegan All very right. long well, it's a good step <laughs> yeah, I, I i was a, a i was a junk food vegan i uh i and i wasn't getting the pro I, I was suffering from malnutrition i mean when i was in hawaii i had my foot stuck in the sand and i twisted and my foot broke it's because your bones are 30% wow. collagen, and I was getting zero collagen. And um, so, yeah, I, I reevaluated things, and I went to just being a vegetarian. Can you tell us maybe some examples of, how, of, of, of best and worst or scary and loving situations you've had with other entities and beings you've met, whether it's the Anshar or it's aliens from other planets, rooms you've been in alone, and just what is it like to be with a being, you know, that's not from our Earth, that doesn't look like us, and is it scary? Yes, it's scary. Um, when, you know, everyone remarks to me about how stoic I am on cosmic disclosure as I'm telling these, you know, it's in front of a 14-foot tall white Draco Royal, you know, and I'm just matter-of-factly telling it. Well, you know, I was scared out of my mind. The um, uh, Secret Space Program uh, security people that were with me, they were scared out of their mind, and they've... Uh, I've seen many different non-terrestrials. I've interfaced with many non-terrestrials. None of them that was such a mind rape as with this reptilian. It was a very powerful being. We all stayed, you know, somewhat calm, cool, and, and collective, but, you know, we thought we were anyway um, during the interaction. But when we got into the uh, elevator that was taking us back up to the top floor where uh, we were uh, dropped off, um, we all began to just shake uncontrollably, you know. And uh, you know, I, I, if I, I, there's no, I mean, my hands was, my hands were shaking so bad it looked like I had like ten hands, and uh, I could barely, my legs were uh, like gelatin. I could barely climb back up into the shuttle. I mean, it was, yeah, it's a very, I mean, you have a very visceral reaction. Now, yeah, that's on the the far extreme to the the scary, you know. Now. 
being interacting with beings um, like Mika or Tirer, you feel of the, the peace and the love coming from them and the understanding they're giving you, um, it helps you overcome the um, fight or flight type of visceral reaction you have. But when I was um, going through the, the MyLab training, they did not just walk us into a room with aliens. They started, we first we would see uh, drawings or pictures of them. Uh, then, um, um, you know, they would do things like when they, uh, the, the first time I uh, consciously, aw in a waking state, saw a gray, uh, you know, I had been picked up by them before, but, you know, it's, is it a dream? Is it a not a dream? You know, but the first time I, like, saw one and it's, like, fully conscious, I was put into one of these, the machines that give you virtual reality that's impossible to tell from, um, you know, reality, the virtual realities. And after you go through the, the different war games or different training sessions they have you in, when I walked into the room, there were uh, people in military uniforms and uh, white coats, you know, sitting down, standing up, you know, card table, you know. And uh, I, when, I, when I come out of the training, I get up and, I, and as I'm walking out, no one says a word, they don't say look over there, but now there's a gray alien sitting at the table just watching. Um, so they slowly acclimate you to, um, to interacting with these beings because um, it, it is a shock, whether they're positive or negative, it is a major shock um, to our psyche. Hi, Corey. Hello. So I am a professional psychic medium, and on a regular daily basis, I'm having active clairvoyant visions for my clients. When it comes to my dreaming state, I have no memory of my dreams unless they're prophetic, okay? And it happens few and far between that I actually remember a dream. And it was very interesting to me that you brought up the solar flare today because a week or two ago, I actually had a dream about it and I had never even heard of a solar flare before. And I, shared, I woke up um, complete ter terror because I didn't even know what I had just witnessed. And so I'm gonna share it with you. Please, um, please. It might help answer some questions, okay. but I'm well, also- Before you share it, can I ask you a question? Have, yes. have you noticed that these remembering of dreams, has it started to increase? Um, I get, well, on August 22nd, I had a very bad dream about the pedophilia in mm. New York and all sorts of different things. So, I mean, this is the second dream in a matter of two months. Mm, yeah. That yeah, and they're okay. all shadow aspects of the collective consciousness yeah. that I seem to get. So um, I was hovering in this dream about the solar flare. I was, I was hovering, my, my dream opened up in me basically hovering in space, <laughs> looking at Earth. And I saw this big, huge wave from the sun coming at Earth. Like it was like a tidal force from the sun coming and Earth started to pass through this um, wave it wasn't a solar flare it was a solar bigger thing than that yeah. <laughs> and i was like whoa and i was just watching it without any um apprehension at that moment but then my consciousness and awareness started zooming in a million miles an hour into the earth the next thing in my dream it phased into me being inside of a uh, major city mm. in in the on the earth and it could have been new york city for all i know we were, um, we meaning myself and other conscious people that knew why we were in the building, we were in um, like a steel reinforced building, skyscraper in the middle of this very active city. And we all knew what was going on outside of us in the streets and we all knew why we were in the building it was because we were basically escaping whatever that big flare was, okay? or the big solar whatever <laughs> I was seeing. And outside, I could see everything that was going on outside because the windows were reinforced in some way, but I could still see through, th through, through them. It looked like solar tornadoes. It looked like a, a very bad hurricane of glowing orange, just wiping everything out in the streets. Um, 
like people were flying through the, the sky, people like everything, cars, everything. So my people and I that were in the um, skyscraper at that time went down into the building or the bottom of the building into the cement basement and kind of just waited. And we all knew by listening to the activity outside when it was over. And then when we came out, the streets were completely empty, but there was no chaos in the streets. There was no mess. It's like everything had evaporated. I felt a sense of um, sadness, but also purpose. Like, okay, the ones that knew to get into the building, I would say the aware ones were saved, yeah. Um, and then there That's was very nothing. interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know, it sounds a lot like uh, kind of the harvest, how it's described in the Law of One, you know, that uh, the, um, the flesh of the, of the ones that are not going to make it are, it, it's, it's are gone, gone. Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, now, it might interest you to know that I've had, I, I have a lot of people that are mediums that contact me. And I've had a number of them tell me very similar dreams. Uh, so, I you know, know mediums are very tapped in to the Akashic and to yeah. the um, mass consciousness. Yeah. And the mass consciousness knows that this is coming, but people like yourself that are like really tapped in are pulling that information down. And, you know. What and do you think I'm supposed to do with this stuff? Because I didn't ask for these dreams. Do I tell yeah. you about them? How, um, I don't know what to do when I get these. I scare Facebook people with yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's why, I mean, I, the, the cataclysm stuff I like, I'm very careful about because people get locked into fear, which lowers their right. vibration. Right, but I'm like helpless when I get this dream right. and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, so I, I just say and it. maybe, maybe it's just for you, you know? Uh, it's just a byproduct of you being so tapped in more than the normal person is aware of. You have an awareness and a connection to the, um, uh, the super consciousness and the Akashic. You're tapped into that. So you're going to be getting feedback. And there, uh, this is a part of the mass consciousness and it causes fear in people. So I might be helping to create it or is that an event no. that's beyond our control? Like the collective consciousness creating it type thing. Well, what I'm told is that that will not necessarily happen if en enough of us awaken and co-create a different reality. Right. And people like yourself are given this information. Um, you know, I, free will. I violated free will for too damn long. So I'm very careful, you know. What do you uh, mean I'm, violated? Well, like if I were, if someone has said, you know, I got this information, what am I supposed to do with it? You know, for me to go and like, you know, tell a person this means this, you should follow this path, when all of us, you know, have to learn from the situation and follow the path ourselves, you know, I, I, could, I could be damaging, you know, uh, by... A f You're kind of answering my question I have for you then, too. Yeah. So I guess I have to ask you a couple Q&A first, too. So would you agree that the universe has no bias as good or evil, right? Everything Agreed, just yes. is, okay. So when it comes to absolution of karma, that we had talked about, I don't know if maybe you were talking about absolution of karma or clearing of karma, because you had talked about crying and basically releasing trauma is what it right. sounded like to me. To me, karma is a little different in how I understand it. Um, it's not trauma. Karma to right. me is like a self-inflicted punishment. Yes because of a belief system. Yes, and, and karma and, and the traumas, I, I, was, I, was, I meant to speak of two different things. Okay. You know, because um, the uh, karma, um, the things that have occurred to you by sociopaths and narcissists in your trauma. life, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that cause a trauma, that's something that dealing with the, the pain and the, the trauma s stops the wheel of karma or it, it um, it, it, it puts the wheel of karma also in perspective to mm -hmm. where you know how to approach it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So basically it's not necessarily, would you say then that it is love that is the absolution of karma or conscious aware choice that is the absolution of karma? Because if you're choosing to not allow yourself to feel guilty anymore for something, yeah. Are you then not just allowing well, yourself to be released from that cycle? 
the state that we're in now, the state of separation, of ego, as, of seeing, you know, uh, I am the person that I was born, you know, in 1970, and these experiences, this is who I am. That is all, you know, a distortion that we have to uh, overcome mm -hmm. in this process. You know, we're, right. um, so, you know, we're, we're all one. And, but we uh, see ourselves as these egos going through these experiences. Right. Um, we have to, um, once we um, fully understand that we are all one and that uh, we're just one little aspect of the one infinite creator having an experience to learn from, that alone begins to release a yes, lot. Yes, that's beautiful. Yes, I yeah. agree with that. Okay. You answered my question. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I just had a quick one. Um, pretty much this whole summer, pro I want to say around May on, um, at least in Pennsylvania here where I live, I've been observing the sky and it looks way different. Like the light, like there's like a different light spectrum. Like I've been calling it like, well, I've been calling it Truman Show sky. Yeah, the sun is different. Yeah, yeah. Like when I was the young, totally the sun different. was yellow. Yeah, so what's going on? I remember what's it, it was yellow, on? now it's white. I mean, it, it looks like a fake sky. Yeah. It, I mean, is it like a projection or what's no. your what Well, everything's going? a projection. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> everything's a projection. But um, no, the sun has been going through a transition for a while. And um, as the sun's going through a transition, so are all of the bodies that orbit it. So we're, we're um, experiencing this, the transition that the sun's going through. I mean, like I said, I, the sun was yellow when I was a kid. I don't know why no one's talking about it. I know. Well, you talk to sci scientists about it, and they're like, oh, that's just ridiculous, you know? When I'm like, no, I was outside when I was a kid. It was yellow, you know? And no, it, well, I think that the Mandela effect is, is a part of everything, you know, the merging of timelines, snapping back together and all that. But um, the thing with the sun is and the sun is going through a transition just like the earth is and just like the fleas are, you know? And, um, you know, we're looking up, you know, trying to interpret through our um, lenses what is occurring. And so the bias that we have are going to keep us, you know, our ego bias is going to keep us from being unified in what is going on and accepting it as everyone accepting the same thing in our, in our co-creative consciousness or our mass consciousness. So if there's not agreement in our mass consciousness on what is going on. So we're going to perceive things through all these different lenses and have uh, different, slightly different experiences. When I, uh, in the programs, there was a nemesis star, a failed star. And we do have uh, other large planets in our system, but they are they were like, uh, the, the charts that I saw, they were like, you know, 17 degrees out of the ecliptic plane, you know. They were kind of like um, Pluto. You know, Pluto's not, uh, you know, orbiting in the ecliptic plane. It's slightly off. So, so are some of these other planetoids that are um, uh, like, uh, there's, well, there's a failed star out there um, that they are calling, that they call Nemesis. There are gas giants that are further I mean, in very far orbit that have been ca uh, expelled from other solar systems and captured by ours, and they hang around for a while, and then they uh, are flung out of the, the orbit. Um, a lot of those things have been tracked, and information has been given to us about non by non-terrestrials. Now, the Nibiru that is depicted in the Sumerian, or, or, in, or, or certain interpretations of Sumerian text, there was nothing in the charts that showed a, a plant, any of these planets that were entering our star system every 3,500 years and um, coming close. What they did note was that the um, dance, the orbit between most stars are bi uh, star systems are binary, and ours is too. It's just uh, it's a failed, uh, you know, like uh, red dwarf, you know, kind of star. And as these orbits occur. Um, they be, at some point, they be, they're a little bit closer together in the orbit, and then the gravitational fields affect, um, you know, the Oort cloud and cause things to fling into uh, the inner solar system, which causes a lot of, you know, problems. 
and it has, you know, for many, many eons. I was, there was no information whatsoever when I was in the programs about uh, a planet with an atmosphere full of gold dust, you know, there, there was just, there was, that, that was not the information I was exposed to. I didn't hear about anything like that until well after I was in the programs and started being introduced to like Zachariah Sitchin and that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you for coming and thank you for me being here. It's been very interesting. Um, my first uh, question, I have to back up with a little bit of information. I have a person that I'm dealing with. He's over in London. And I've been a healer for about 40 years. And before that, as a child, I was working with animals and such and healing animals. I was called Nature Girl in the, in the area. And um, my friend in London has a very similar story about the 20 year on Mars as you do, except he was amazing things. He was, t all his insides were taken out. He was, be they tried to take, him and make him a cyborg, I guess it is, or a militarized person. Um, and he's 48 years old now, and he's trying to come to grips with the memories that are coming back to him. And I wanted to ask you, are you monitored and tracked by uh, ships all the time? Because he has um, what look like helicopters, but he's not on the flight path of any, any helicopter over outside of London. And um, he says they, they're about 200 feet up. He can see all the detail on it and everything. And what came to me or was told to me is that they are following him. They're keeping track of him. Do you, do you have that on a daily basis? I would assume so. Mm -hmm. But you don't see them? Or? But I see them often. Mm. But they're not always from the same source. Right. I mean, I have very curious beings coming in. Um, I'll tell you a, a couple examples real quick. Uh, one time I'm sitting in the house we just moved out of, and this small ship appears in the room. <laughs> and it looks like it's about the size of a wheel without the tire on a big rig, you know? Yeah. And it was very similar that the sides were concave. And it was sitting there slowly turning, and I could feel that there were many, many beings inside of this little bitty ship. And I asked later on, I asked uh, Kari, and she said they were just uh, in to observe you. Observe. They're to observe you, to take a closer look. And w at the house we were in before that, my wife and I were hearing all these footsteps running around on the ceiling. <laughs> And then we hear footsteps running around the floor around us, but we don't see anything. And it went on for like two days. And um, I, I knew that I felt a presence. I knew there was someone there, but I didn't know what was going on. Finally, I was <laughs> sitting on the toilet, you know, <laughs> sitting there thinking, deep in thought. And uh, I, I heard footsteps come up close to me. It was just a few feet away, but I couldn't see anything. But these, th this being leaned in and leaned into my awareness so I could see it. And I saw it, it had a head about the size of a grapefruit. Yeah. And the top of its head was kind of like in, um, uh, what was that Will Smith movie with the invasion, you know, Fourth of July. It looked kind of like that, but it, it didn't look evil. or anything. It, was, it had a very peaceful energy about it. But it had that kind of a hammerhead kind of cartilage looking thing on the top of its head. And it leaned in, and it just wanted me to see, you know, who it was. Noticing. And then it pulled back, and then they left. They, they weren't there anymore, and it was, they were there to observe. So, yeah, a lot of weird things happen like that. Um, many people have been with me when I've, I see a craft. And usually what occurs is, um, like I said, if you hang out with me long enough, you're going to see something. And usually what they've seen is we'll be outside, and someone will they'll say, did you see that? And I'm, I know immediately what they're talking about, uh, like a, a gray uh, uh, sphere, metallic looking sphere, will pop out from behind the clouds and pop back in, do a peekaboo thing, come in and out, in and out. That's or right. it'll pop out and stay there and, and zig, 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 and then go back. And, and the people with me mostly, most of the time had not ever seen a UFO. But uh, that is a consistent thing I, I've seen. 
And like I said, the people that will see it and they'll talk about it, they'll be amazed because they've never seen anything like that. They don't believe in that kind of thing. Uh, the next day, if I try to talk to uh, most of them, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But um, I'm definitely, you know, under observation, but I'm, I'm not aware all the time. I don't see, you know, craft, the same type of craft around, you know, that's the same group observing me. I've seen many, I've had many encounters with alien beings and ships, both. I have many, many pictures on file of uh, crafts that have, I've been near. It's, it's really hard for people to understand that, um, and it's, the logistics of it is, is the hardest part. Every single person on the planet is being uh, picked up. Everybody, at some point, they're being picked up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just a part of what's going on. Can you talk one, one thing about how you're being protected? Can you talk about that? That is kind of involved, and uh, I'm being protected to a certain point. I'm being protected from, a, from certain things. But um, David calls it authorizing. Like, if I begin to affect people's um, free will, then I begin to authorize the dropping of any protection that I have. So most of it depends on my own behavior and my own outlook on things. But I've been told that in every war, there are casualties, and this is a war. So there's no, there's no guarantee that I'm gonna survive. You know, I could have some crazy person that's manipulated, uh, you know, sit in a crowd and hop up with a gun and shoot me. Any kind of thing, things like that can happen. Uh, and if it does, you know, then I'm okay with that just because of the understanding I've been given about what life is and about how really kind of insignificant the ego experience of separation is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's no guarantees. This is what you're doing so important to us who are still in the body. Not out of body, but in the body. Right, right. But... Uh, well, there's been several times to where my, my sanity was in question for myself. myself you know, uh, when I was through the programs, I had uh, many, many, many dozens of different beings that I either interfaced with or I sat on the other side of a, uh, a window while they were being interrogated. And I, you know, I was, but I was, I wasn't directly interfacing with them. I was just picking up their emotions and thought, you know, trying to report back to the interrogator. So, um, when uh, a eight-foot-tall blue bird appeared to me, and I'd never heard of anything like it or seen anything like it, uh, there was, you know, these Project Bluebirds out there and all these things. Um, I was extremely concerned about my sanity. I was like, okay. I've either gone nuts or somebody's like beaming shit into my head, you know? <laughs> so I was very, you know, very concerned. Um, and I went through, after the experience with uh, that white Draco, uh, it took me days. I had like an etheric hangover. You know, my brain hurt and I felt drained for days. But it also affected my, my psyche to where, you know, I, I was not acting myself, you know? And... So you, your psyche is going to be affected by any type of interaction with these beings. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Corey, on the um, last few slides, you gave us a lot of different websites to go to, and especially for organizing. And, um, and I'm interested in, I'm really interested in organizing meditation groups or like protest groups or something. Is there one of those sites that's better for that or not? Where yeah, we can if you go to secretspaceprogram.com, that's um, the best at the one. top, one of the things, I can't remember the name, uh, I don't know if it's organized or it's something similar to that. Mm -hmm. If you click on it, it brings you to another page because we're still just building this out. It brings you to that meetup page to where you can start organizing people in your area. Uh, it, there are a number of tools that we have developed and are developing um, that are going to you know, help people come together. But like I said, I don't want everybody coming necessarily uh, together under, uh, you know, the, uh, the idea of the Blue Avians or the idea of the, we all need to come together 
we're not going to be able, I mean, just agree to disagree on our belief systems and uh, find a way to come together and focus on, you know, just getting the truth, which is something we all are interested in. And on one of the last slides, there was a spaceship that you showed. It was like a cylindrical group or craft. That was, that was the research vessel I was on. We, we just saw that last Sunday, um, and it disappeared into a cloud just like that. Is that so it's not a, a non-terrestrial It's group? ours. It's ours. About 90% of what we see that we think are ET are ours. Nice. Because we now control our own airspace. We didn't, we didn't have that ability before. So they, yeah. Hi, Corey. I um, was wondering what the Anshar and the Blue Avians think of us. Like, do they kind of look at us as like, like we might look at a monkey? And no, <laughs> let me explain this to you. Because this upsets people too. Now, I don't, because of these lenses I was talking about, Americans, like if you go to, let's say, um, you know, like I went to Haiti, you know, uh, you know when I was like 15. Uh, and I noticed that people in our group that had come from America were looking kind of down at people from uh, like a third world country, seeing them, you know, they're not as sophisticated as us, they're not this, they're not that. Well, it's um, not like, it's similar, uh, not necessarily the answer, but a lot of these beings, they look at us as completely underdeveloped, you know, and uh, it's, it's a mess. I mean, that uh, most of these beings do not want to come down. They don't want to interact with us. Um, uh, interacting with us is, uh, it's very unpleasant for them. Um, but yes, they, uh, many of them, I can't say all of them because the Anshar, they see us as where they were at one time and they have a loving, nurturing uh, energy towards us. But a lot of these non-terrestrial beings, you know, they look at us like anything from pets, you know, to, you know, like a scientist who picks out the, picks up the rat, you know, if the rat gets upset or stressed or whatever, well, you know, it's, I'm going to, you know, it's the rats compared to my lifetime, the rat's only going to be here, you know, a year, you know, many of them have that type of perception of us. Hi, Corey. My name is Allison. Hello. I want to thank you for your bravery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am a naturopath, a Reiki master, and a medium, and I can't remember not being a medium since I was probably four years old. Um, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because I'm also part of Vivian's post-disclosure support group, and I am listed on that site, and I listen to you all the time because I think I speak for a lot of people in this room that we are hungry for direction and truth and honesty, and I have made it my life's purpose to try to help others with truth and honesty. And uh, I just was curious if the Anshar or other species or you will continue to guide us um, with more truth so that we're able to continue to help others in a ripple effect, if that makes any sense. The closer we get to this event, <clears throat> the more I'm going to be taken out of the process. Okay, that was my fear. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Don't be afraid. Okay. Be happy because the Anshar and other groups, they are starting to connect with people through dream states. You know, they're connecting with people's higher selves, and and your higher self determines if you get a uh, communication, mm -hmm. what type of communication you'll get, or what type of preparation you need before a communication. Right. The positive beings approach you that way. They have to. It's cosmic law. Okay. So um, I am going to fade into the background of chatter. All of these people already are starting to contact me. They're getting um, communications in dream states, and they're going to develop into face-to-face -face communications okay. with um, a lot of these different beings, not just the Anshar. So, um, and I'm happy about this. I am, uh, I'm just going to be one voice among many yeah. as time goes by. And people like the two of you, the mediums, you know, star seed types that are here, service to others, and are open to that, are going to start receiving it first. But eventually, everyone uh, is going to start to have some sort of um, a communication that their higher self uh, allows 
or okay. you know so yeah because I see the fear and mm -hmm. and I can feel it from others you know that empathetic piece of feeling the fear from others and wanting to kind of quiet that noise quiet their energy make them feel at ease and and less chaos so I guess yeah. I, I was just fearful of myself saying fear You're fearful myself for others to to quiet that and and get the truth so I mean I I feel I feel them. I resonate with what you were saying in, in the sense that I hear them and I feel them, but sometimes they don't always step outside the veil. I've seen it a few times, but it's not often that they'll do it. So when I feel it and I don't see anything, that's where I'm like, okay, is, is right. more information coming or, you know, so I can feel the anticipation and, and that little bit of anxiety. So. Right. <clears throat> it's, this is changing from a uh, spectator sport to an all-inclusive <laughs> game, yeah. you know? We're all being pulled into it. Uh, if, the, if what the Anshar have told me, has told me, are, if it's remotely true, then I'm, going, I'm just gonna be a part of the wider chatter of all these other people that are starting to get this communication. And usually it's gonna happen through dreams, you know? Okay. And, inform and information downloads is uh, one of the things I didn't mention that happened during the eclipse after the answer gave me this information, I thought, okay, the eclipse, if we get a certain amount of people meditating, everyone's gonna say, oh, I saw uh, an Anshar, I had a visitation. <laughs> but they were like, no, 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 no. You yeah. know, it was me looking through my lens again. Exactly. You know, um, that uh, they were going to uh, be mainly what occurred during the eclipse and has occurred since then are people getting downloads. I hear more than any else I don't hear about people saying oh I'm having more I, I have heard this people having dreams about these beings or but the main thing that's being reported to me are people out of the blue receiving downloads of information and that's to prepare that's their higher self allowing you to receive information for you to be prepared to have more contact okay wonderful thank you hi Corey um, the, I have a very quick question, but before I start, I also want to mention a little bit thing, and my husband insists I should say that uh, I did uh, the volunteer work of the translate the, your website from English to the Chinese for the oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. sphere being yeah. aligned. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed at the interest coming from China. There's a lot of very awakened people there, and we receive very little news or information about what's going on in, in China and other places, so we don't realize the growth that's occurring there. There's a lot of very awake people there. My question will be, um, I have been working with my higher self for several years. I know how to do it, but I don't understand the concept. Is our higher self from different dimensions, from different timelines or something like that? Yes. Um, <laughs> The way it was shown to me, which is very hard to depict, I'm trying to get some animators to help me. Um, it, they, oh man, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I'll start at the bottom then, I guess. You have self, and then you have the higher self, and the higher self goes up through all the densities until it connects back to the one infinite creator. It branches off from the one infinite creator. And right now, and ego-wise, we're here in and self. And as we go up, we go to higher self. And then until self drops off and there's just higher until you return to the one infinite creator. We're all aspects. It's almost like eddies twisting down and you're coming down to this density of, and, and this awareness of self. Does that make sense? Sort of, yeah. It's really hard to, but yes, we are multi-dimensional beings that we all have the same connection. We're all, I mean, there's no difference between us. We all have the same connection uh, that in, in, in origin, which is the one infinite creator. And we're all a branch of that one infinite creator with different levels of awareness. And the level of awareness we have right now is down in the ego and self. And as consciousness expands and we go up these higher rungs of consciousness and higher self, we'll get to the point where self won't even be a part of the equation in our experience. It'll just be higher, the higher. So where do you think you go before you, when you re, re, reincarnate? Do you die, you go where before you come back to get to the Yeah, you know, um, I don't know. 
And if I were to tell you, I would just be telling you my belief system. So I think we've done in like that bubble you're talking about. Yeah, well, maybe. Um, I, I may not have the ability to conceive what that realm is like. You know, our level of consciousness, we can't perceive certain things. Thank you. Greenwald and I'm the producer of the Empowered Light Holistic Expo. The Expo is held twice a year outside of Philadelphia in Oaks, Pennsylvania. My experience here has been awesome. There's a lot of energy here. There's a lot more energy than I expected there really is. First timer, it was actually more than I expected. All the vendors, they take their time, they explain things to you, and they make you feel welcome and warm. My experience at the Expo has been life changing. Uh, I've learned a lot about myself that has been incredible. Well, it's much more than what I expected. Between the speakers, the vendors, and all the products I found. Once again, the energy that's here, it's great. The people that I've met and the different speakers that I've listened to actually have enlightened my initial basic thinking of this way of life. So I would definitely say it's a positive experience and I'm so glad that I came. Light Expo really has the uh, pull of getting people from all different categories of life. Like last night we had two guys who've never been to the show before, didn't know anything about it, and they were having a blast. They were actually loving it because the wives dragged them here, but then they were buying more stuff than the wives were, so it was really cool. There's just so many things happening, so many different readings and stuff. I've never experienced so much in one area. I find things that I'm drawn to that it's changed my thinking about a lot of things. The Empowered Light Holistic Expo is different from any other expo because this is about centering your energy, centering your chakras. Most expos I go to are mostly health and wellness and they try to sell you products like with chemicals and things of that nature. This is all natural, all holistic and the energy is amazing. Well, I think it's very diverse. There is things that you wouldn't normally see at a regular expo or experience or actually have the chance to partake in as far as healing, um, positive vibes and good energy. It's really awesome. There's literally a tangible energy. There's good people.